So today we're going to talk about a revolutionary new method that can predict the structure of a protein from just a sequence. The method is called AlphaFold, or AlphaFold 2, and it was uh, released in 2024. Uh, so the problem we're studying here is the protein folding lamb problem. So basically you want to have a sequence, protein, and we know that in uh, nature it folds quite rapidly to a given structure. And it does so by sort of searching in energy landscapes as demonstrated here. And in a millisecond, seconds, most proteins fold to a stable structure and one unique stable structure with some variation. And... Uh, yeah, and but it's not in most cases a single pathway. It's, a, it's, a, it's like many, many pathways that leads to the same results. And that sort of illustrates that it's very likely that the fold structure is the low free low energy. So this is a problem people start, started studying for 50 years or more. And uh, the largest thing has been to, to try to understand the energy functions. Basically, what is what is it? Energy that governs protein and folding, and there are a lot of different types of energies involved, including like final balls energies, high electrostatic energies, hydrogen bonds, etc. And probably most important is hydrophobicity. So basically, a protein has hydrophobic residues on the inside because they want to be stay away from water, and hydrophilic residues on the outside to a large extent. So this has been known, and these energy functions have been built on both on first principle from physics and but also on statistical knowledge based potentials. Unfortunately, none of these methods has really worked. So simulating the folding of a protein did never, has not really worked yet. Partly because we might not have the computational power, but partly also because the energy functions might not be accurate enough. However, evolution can come to our, our rescue here. So can we use evolution information? And why should we be able to use that? Well, so if you seek evolution, you have a sequence here in some organism, and then you can search the database, as we have learned earlier in this course, and you find homologous sequences in other databases. And these sequ protein sequences have very similar structure in most cases. And you can find patterns of mutations. So some positions in these multiple sequence alignments you obtain are completely conserved. Some are variable in different ways. And if you look at the average of these things you see okay conserved position might mean that it is important and it means that it's important for some reason it could be part of active site it could also be because it's maybe internal to the protein and it's very important for binding with residues there but a variable position can be uh, having be just completely variable like the one to the right or take have a we call a co-evolutionary signal that means that it's either blue or yellow on different sides here so every it's one blue and one yellow every pair but they can switch between each other so that's what we call co-evolution so, uh, we go back to the first step. We take this everything. It's like you can use this uh, proof bias, this multiple six alignment, to improve secondary structures. So, you can say, for instance, take the sequence here, which is actually identical in those cases. In one case, it's a beta strand. In another case, it's an alpha helix. However, if you use the profile, the sequence logos with multiple six alignments are quite different in these cases. And we can do good predictions of the maximum. You know that one should be here, this one should be a protein. So you can see in the one to the left, you have a better conserved valence, for instance, that are more likely to be beta sheets. Or in other case, you have alanines and isolucines that are more likely to be alpha helices. Although it's not the same amino acids in this particular short part of the sequence. So until recently, people had this kind of one, one way to do this. Combining this information, you had a sequence, you did this MSA, you had a profile, you did some secondary structure prediction, you had some fragments, you try to put these fra fragments together and you have the folding. So this was a state of the art until maybe five, six years ago. And it worked in some cases, but not in all cases. Far from all cases, and it was not very accurate in most cases. However, we know that the number of sequences is increasing much faster than the number of structures. So that means that for each protein structure we have, we have more and more sequence information. So if we can use this information in a good way, we should be able to improve the predictions. And here is what co-evolution comes in. So we have these positions here that are co-evolving. So basically you have either blue, yellow, blue, or yellow here. And that is very likely due to that they are in contact in the protein structure. So because they are in contact, so you have a specific limited space or amount of space, and you have a co-evolution signal there.
So if you can identify these co-evolving signals, you might use this context predict structure. Or you can see this other way like this. You think about the protein that is well packed like this. It's like part, two parts of proteins are well packed. You have a uh, no gaps, nothing, no gaps like that. And then there's mutation. It makes it less well packed. So you have mutating pentamer to an arrow. Heck is not as well. And then it's going to be a pressure, evolutionary pressure, to have a compensating mutation. So you can have mutate in this quadratic to a pent pentamer again. And you get a nice pick again. However, you also have changes here on the other side because it's not the same. The arrow is not the same as the pentamer. So you will have sort of interaction or in couplings between the uh, new pentamer and the new policy it has. We have indirect couplings. And this indirect coupling was something that, that made this co-evolutionary analysis not work very well until people realized how to deal with it, which happened maybe 10 years ago. So yeah, you can use these contact prediction methods to predict distances. Context. So this is an example. You have two different methods, one called cycle, one called PLMDCA, and they are trying to predict context here. So this is a protein, I have a gray dot, this is a content of protein structure, this is protein you see over here, and the blue are the correct predictions and the red are the incorrect predictions with these two, two different methods that are compensating for it. And as you can see, many of these contacts are correct predictors, not all of them, but it's enough good content predictors to be able to make a good model of a protein. You can see some of the contacts predicted here by arrows. Uh, but certainly it's missing. You can also notice another thing is that these contacts here in the protein are not randomly distributed. They have certain patterns, but a particular diagonal pattern, but not only diagonal patterns, more complex patterns also. And of course, it's something that machine learning is good at, it's to recognize patterns. So yeah, so if you can see that you have one contact here, it's quite likely that you have other contacts also predicted in the diagonal around it. So you see, so if you can use that, you can maybe improve the contact predictions. So, uh, yeah, so this is another example. We have a pretty context and the, and the real contacts are here. And you see that you can make a nice model of it using some software for modeling. So this is an example of this can work. And you see in, in some cases, the real structure that's predicted is very similar to the blue one that was uh, using these kind of methods. And this is the state of the art as it was in, in 2018. And then AlphaFold 1 was released, which is not the, the AlphaFold 2. And it's similar to what we had done before with pink or C4 or a particular method called Raptor X. So it, it takes, it, the big difference is that it predicted distances, not only contact, it predicts actually probability of two residues to have a certain distance from each other. Uh, and it used modern deep learning methods, particularly used convolution and network of from deep and other things. Uh, and then it could actually use this to make its prediction much faster using a simple steepest descent protocol. And this allowed a significant improvement of prediction qualities. So this is a part of the CASP data set or, or CASP prediction methods. So CASP is run a meeting run every two years where people do blind structure predictions. And you have, we have a score called GDTTS, which is basically zero is random, 100 is, is perfect, and somewhere around 90 is probably where you have experimental accuracy of two proto structures compared to a predictive structure with a native structure. And you can see that for easy targets defined by how that you have something quite similar in the data base, based on PDB. You already in CASP 1, which was 1994. There were good predictions, many models were similar. However, then it's rapidly decreased. So at the difficult targets in the beginning, you have not something that was very close to random. And then in the first two casts for the difficult targets, it's improved a little bit. But after basically cast four, cast five, the performance was quite similar and it was a very small improvement. So maybe some improvement in cast 12, but a quite marginal one still, because that's when this DCA metal is gone there. And then suddenly it was a jump in performance in cast 13. From like an average of about 40 to an average of about 60 GTTS. So this is some of the predictions, and you can see that there are blue one is predicting, green one is the native one, and they're quite similar, not perfectly, but they're quite similar in all these cases. And this is a description of what this method does. This is basically 
alphafold one, or this case is Tiroshetta, which is a development uh, or almost a clone about it. It's quite similar. So what it does is that it starts with multiple sequence alignments, uses these co-evolutional coupling methods, these DCA methods, a few of these, and, but it also it takes information from this PSSM and the sequence and other things, and it makes all this together. So the sequence information you, you take and you make as an outer product and you get to add those to a pair with information. So you have information about um, uh, every pair of residues in your MSA. And you can then, but it's uh, but it's not it's not the MSAs directly, it's the information about this probability for it to be in contact. So you have this PLM, this this copic Co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co-co
I and J are close, and J and K are close, then I and K should also be close to each other. So it updates the information between them. Like that. So you can ignore, if, so you can put structural strength into it somehow. And then it outputs this sum, the MS data representation, and the perhaps this again. And then it repeats this 48 times. You can reason a lot about the structure. And after 48 rounds, it can turn on the, uh, it goes to the structure module, which takes this pair representation, the single representation, as uh, uses something called invariant point attention, and it predicts the, the relative rotation translation of, of each residue compared to the ones before. So basically, you can think of the residues as like a triangular blocks. So it has the rotation and translation of these ones. And then it does this eight times, actually. It rotates eight times to, at the end, predict the uh, angles and the computation all atom positions. So it basically has the side chains also, and then it predicts the side chains. So it starts with sort of a gaze, gas phase, so it starts actually with everything in the point in the middle, and then it explodes and then puts all the rest together. So that's quite different from earlier methods that try to do these things because they worked with like a chain of proteins that were connected this particular way. Here, each reaction is actually separate. So in theory, it could make proteins were not connected, but because the structural information is very strong, it doesn't. Yes, this is this is again. Okay, so this is how Apple drug works, and it was uh, developed in twenty. 20 was and there was in uh, alpha for in the in cas 14 it was shown the results then it was released in 2021 in summer and people start using it and we knew a few things that are limiting but um it's not very good to pick if, 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 if uh, change false not so if you make a mutation that makes it protein unstable it won't it won't it'll still make a good model of it in most cases you can maybe do some post-processing do it later uh you can, there are some people studying that you can predict structured states, so if you have an open and bound form, you, know, you can probably get it out of the fold, but it's not really certain about it. There are ways to trick it to do that more. Uh, if you have proteins that are disordered, long, flexible repeat proteins, like this one here to the top, which is an abelene, you will not get a good structure of it, because it uh, basically doesn't have any co-evolution signals, so you will get something that it will make well, globular, but it's probably not how it looks like. It, may, it doesn't do anything about, about, the, about physics of proteins. So if you have a transmembrane protein, it might put the transmembrane region in the wrong place, but it knows that it's sort of not bound to the rest of the protein. It so knows something about it, but not the real that it should be a membrane. It might, if you have several, it might not know that one part should be inside and outside the membrane, etc. And then sometimes it has problems with when the other molecules that are bound to it, also like a big DNA binding complex, etc. It doesn't make room for it. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. And most importantly, I thought because it was released, it was open source, it has created a lot of um, uh, spin offs. So there um, are many thousand citations already, used it for different things and different tools and things, etc. And this is just a small subset of possible extensions that have been used. So we have used completely protein interactions and others have done the same thing, but it's used for ligand bonding, etc., 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 a lot of things. And you can run it using what's called Colab Fold, which is quite simple. It's a, a notebook that you can run on, on Google's Colab platform that you often, even for free, get access to a GPU. If you pay, you can be guaranteed an access to a GPU. Uh, and it's simple using, you put in a sequence and you can run it. And it has a few things. That you can, I mean, you can also play other things. It generates the MSAs. Using NN62 that we haven't discussed, but it's a very, very fast method to generate MSAs. So it takes minutes instead of hours. And then it has all these tricks. You can model the protein, protein complexes. You can play around with number of recycles. You can play around with parameters and so on. You can do some other things, tricks. So it's, it's quite well documented and works quite well. And we have said, taken it and made it able to predict protein protein interactions. So you can take two MSAs. You merge them together and you make a prediction of the residue pattern. As you can see in this case, the prediction is quite good. The basic blue, I mean, one here is a model, one is not a model, and the prediction is almost perfect. So, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. But so now in the lab, we're going to basically try to run up for a little bit and see how it works using this cool lab. So, thank you very much. And um, yeah, see you in the lab. <laughs>